Okay, hello everyone. Uh, good evening, and welcome to uh, welcome to the welcome to the Secrets of the Seabird webinar series, episode four. Um, thank you so much for joining us uh, on this lovely evening. It has stopped raining, so we really appreciate you joining us uh, for this uh, webinar, um, which is coming to you as part of the EU Life Remedies Project, which we'll talk to you a little bit about later on. But as episode four, hopefully some of you have come to our previous episodes and you'll know that this is part of, of that project. Um, tonight's topic uh, is all about uh, seahorses, sharks, slugs and snails. Uh, it's a bit of a mouthful that title. I try to get as many S's in there as possible. I think I manage that. Um, a surprise, surprising species of the seabed. Um, so we are going to hear from some amazing speakers tonight, all about those things, about seahorses, sharks, slugs, and snails. Uh, we're going to hear about how amazing they are, how they rely on seagrass, how they're important to our oceans, uh, and a little bit uh, about how we can we can help them out as well. So. Um, just to find out a little bit more about the speakers that we've got this evening, uh, we do have uh, some wonderful people. We've got Neil Garrett Maidman, who's uh, the executive director and founder of the Seahorse Trust. Uh, he's got an enormous wealth of experience working in the natural world with wildlife, uh, not just seahorses, but all sorts of other animals as well. Uh, and as founder of the Seahorse Trust uh, in the year 2000, uh, he's had an awful lot of involvement. Uh, in working with these beautiful creatures uh, and it's going to tell us uh, a lot of wonderful information about them. Uh, we also have Lizzie Elliott who works at the Ocean Cons Conservation Trust within the National Marine Aquarium uh, as a support biologist. Uh, she is a champion of all invertebrates, uh, she loves the tiny things uh, and she's going to be talking to us about uh, the slugs and the snails. Uh, and then last but not least we do have Paul Cox, uh, Managing Director of the Shark Trust. Uh, and sharks being good in introduction, they are the, the poster creature of the oceans um, and it may be surprising to know that we do get them in seagrass beds so he's going to tell us, tell us uh, all about them. Uh, some amazing speakers, uh, really looking forward to hearing from all of them uh, and thanks to them for joining us. Hopefully if they turn their videos on they can give us a little wave uh, and we can see what they look like as well. Really exciting. Wonderful, there they are. <laughs> Wonderful people. Uh, so that's your speakers. Just before we do get going into the webinar itself, uh, just a little bit of information for you so you know what to expect. Uh, it's about 60 minutes long. Uh, we're a little bit fluid with our time and we're not too strict, so it might just go a little bit over. Um, hopefully that won't keep you from your dinners for too long, but uh, we'll try to stick to 60 minutes. Um, about 45 minutes of that roughly will be uh, our lovely panellists speaking to you. Uh, and then we'll have about 10-15 minutes for questions at the end. Uh, now when it comes to questions please ask as many as you can as many as you like uh, pop those if you'll see at the bottom i know we're all very familiar with zoom these days we've had a lot of practice um, but if you're a bit sure i'm sure at the bottom of your screen you've got a q a box that's the one we'd like you to use there is a chat box as well try to ignore that one go for q a uh, that one will allow you to ask our panelists questions uh, they may answer those as we go along through the webinar by writing back to you uh, or we may save your question and ask it at the end uh, and that will be exciting too. Uh, so that's the process we're going to go through. Uh, if we don't manage to get to your question we will put up some contact, contact information at the end of the webinar uh, where you can get in touch with, with us as well. Um, as I said I'll just have a little bit of an introduction to this project. Um, I won't talk for too long because you're not here to listen to me. Uh, but the Life Recreation Remedies Project is a four year EU funded project uh, which is looking to improve the, the, um, the quality, the, the condition uh, of seabed habitats within five special areas of conservation. Uh, so we've got the Arza Silly Complex, we've got Fallon Helford, we've got Plymouth Sound and Estuaries, Silent Maritime, and Essex Estuaries as well. So five very different special areas of conservation, all of which have got incredible seabird habitats which are sadly in unfavourable conditions. So the aim of this project, what we're going to do uh, throughout the four years is improve the condition of those habitats uh, and we're doing that through uh, targeted behaviour change projects as well as restoration, so habitat restoration, replanting seagrass in the seabed, uh, particularly in Plymouth and Solent. Uh, so that's the, the goals of the project and part of that is to tell people about it and that's, that's why we're doing this, this webinar series. Now I'm going to stop talking and I'm going to hand over to our first wonderful panellist. Uh, so we have Neil Garrett Maidman uh, from the Seahorse Trust and he's going to tell us all about those magical creatures. Thanks, lovely. Um, yeah, I mean, incredible creatures, seahorses. I'm just going to share my screen with you. Um, 
Oh, hang on, bear with, there we go. Hang on a second. Um, ah, lovely, I think you've disabled the share screening. Can, um, Apologies, Neil, you should have hello. it now. Hello, sir. I've got it, there we go. Um, okay, have you got that? Yes, we're all good, thank you. Neil. Brilliant, lovely, thanks. Okay, um, I'm the executive director and founder of the Seahorse Trust. I've worked with seahorses for about six years now, and, and as Lovedo was saying, you know, a host of other species as well. And it's very important to actually work with a wide variety of species to understand what's happening to our natural world. And this was actually photographed at uh, Stud, or video I should say, at Stud Bay in Dorset. This actual animal is, is hunting for food, not um, bothered by the divers at all. You can see it's stretching around inside the, the weeds there. And I'll tell you more about how they do that a bit later on. But first of all, I just wanted to show you some of my favourite seahorses. We've got Tyrone, a seahorse rex, a seahorse, a sea pony, and a sea donkey. Now, if you think that lot are very confusing, when you come to the real animal, it's even more confusing. It's so unlike any other animal in the ocean. And as you go, as we go on through the talk, you'll you'll see what I mean. Oh, sorry, we'll go back there. There's so much we don't know about seahorses. Um, I mean, we literally have just scratched at the surface of them. Um, and we understand a few things about them, but before we even get a chance to understand that they are disappearing, you know, Neptune's little seahorse of the sea is very, very vulnerable. Even in our waters, which are relatively protected, they are very vulnerable from so many different reasons. I think we ought to start off with the basic question, what is a seahorse? And it's a fish. I mean, it's a true fish, and but it's like no other fish that you've ever seen before. In fact, the Victorians actually thought they were um, they were sort of insects because when they dry out, they go quite hard and bony, and they have this strange skeletal um, structure to them. Now, for those that are into taxonomy, you've got all the different kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, uh, species, and common names. But the crucial things are. Um, things like hippocampus, the genus name, hippo meaning horse, and campus me meaning um, caterpillar or monster. Um, the signathidae name is quite strange and it relates directly to their snout, sin meaning fused, and naphus meaning jaw, because you would imagine really a seahorse, and if you believe some of the children's cartoons, they eat like crocodiles, but they don't actually do that, as we'll see in a minute. There are approximately 45 to 65 different species from around the world. Um, it depends on who you listen to, to how many seahorses there are. And we actually use Sarah Lowry's um, classification system for Project Seahorse, because in our eyes, it's the most accurate um, classification there is. There is one chap that thinks there's about 120 different seahorses. There's other people that think there are less, but Sarah, Sarah seems to have the most accurate um, uh, system out there. Now, most people think of seahorses as a very tropical species, but that couldn't be further from the truth, as this map shows. There are seahorses in cold water all over the world, and our recent work has actually shown them up around Denmark, Norway, Sweden, up as far as the Faroe Islands. There's even suggestion right over the top of Norway and around into Russia as well. There's some recordings that um, we think we can take seriously, but, you know, um, they, they are found in very cold water, as cold as six degrees. They're right down into 70 uh, metres down, sometimes 80 metres down. So there are actually more seahorses in the tropical areas, but there are less species, um, if that makes sense. We have a lot more species in the colder water, but there are less of them. But as they are in the cold water, they're actually much bigger than they are in the, in the tropical waters, because a lot of animals have to adapt to cold in, in cold water to being bigger, being able to hold more food in them, to be able to cope with the temperatures. Now, around the British Isles, we've got two species. We've got the short snouted, um, which is this one in, the, in this picture here. The blue lines show where we actually have recordings of short snouted seahorses. They could actually be in all those areas where there's not blue lines. We can't put the blue lines on the map because we haven't got the concrete proof. But having worked with them for so long now, I'm pretty convinced that they would be in those areas as well. 
The other species, and the one that really is the star of tonight's show, is the spiny seahorse. And again, same thing. Um, we've got these orange lines where we have definite proof of where they are. And they could be in the average areas as well, but which we can't put them on the map because we haven't had the concrete information to prove it. But more and more information is coming in all the time. So we're building on, on this data. Now, the size of the seahorse, the smallest seahorse is roughly about one centimetre from the top of the head to the end of the coronet. And the largest one is roughly about 30 centimetres. That's Hippocampus ingans, and that's off the west coast of the Americas. However, in 2015, we had a remarkable finding off um, Studland, just off Old Harry in, in Studland, of a 34 centimetre spiny seahorse. Now, it was given to us by a fisherman, and we normally sort of have to be a bit cautious about fishermen's tails and what have you, but he did send a photograph in where it was against a true measure. Um, it was actually a bass uh, ruler, so we could prove it was 34 centimetres. He also found one at 30 centimetres and 28 centimetres as well. Now interestingly if seahorses are left alone and unmolested they will grow to quite a size and this one we estimated was about 15 to 20 years old. From research work I've done in captivity I know they go on to at least 12 years, the spiny seahorses, um, so there's no reason to doubt that this one was about 15 to 20 years. Now, seahorses are remarkable. They, they have these seal gills. Um, now, the seal gills are like old-fashioned fire bellows, um, and they're sealed all around the top, except for two tiny little siphon holes at the very top. Now, that helps to feed, power the food through their snout, um, through opening and closing. It creates quite, quite a um, sort of power as it goes through. But interestingly, inside the, the gills, it's shaped like a bunch of grapes. Now, this allows them to go into fresh water for short periods of time. And relevant to, to remedies and what have you, we've had them up the estuaries in um, the Solent, in, in the Tamar, up into fresh water, as well as into salt water. This is only a short term arrangement, but they can do it. And these are the siphons I was talking about at the very top of the head. And the water literally comes through the mouth, which is at the very front of the snout, out through the um, siphons and sucks the um, food, the shrimp that they're eating, through, through the snout. Now, the thing about the eyes on seahorses is remarkable. They can actually see forwards and backwards at the same time. And they're a bit like chameleons that um, have this sort of double um, directional sort of seeing. Um, but what is really remarkable about them is they have excellent eyesight and it's in full color, even in low light levels. But this excellent um, eyesight and being able to see in low light, low light levels can be detrimental to them because if say for instance, you take a picture of a seahorse with a flash or you have bright lights and stuff like that, it can actually create stress in the animal. This is why it's illegal in the British Isles to actually photograph and film seahorses with lights and flash because it causes so much damage. Now interestingly they can see in a different tint depending on where the species naturally occurs. So a, a seagrass type seahorse can see with a green tint, a coral species seahorse can actually see with a blue tint. It's almost like a, a sunglass for them and the whole reason for that is it helps to define the prey in the actual habitat they live in. So having sharper vision with a tint of the relevant colour makes them very, very good at being able to see what they're actually doing under, under the water. Now this one is a, a narrow-bellied seahorse, a Hippocampus angustifolia, or also known as a Hippocampus angustus. Um, and if you look at the snout, uh, the bands around the snout, that is actually to help up, help the break the outline of the snake when they're probing in amongst the weeds and algae that they live in. Very much like a zebra has stripes, it breaks up the outline. And, and it's a perfect way of camouflaging in different types of habitat. Now, I was talking about at the beginning the signafto, which means fused jaw. Now, some children draw seahorses as having a crocodile like mouth, but it actually is right at the very end, in that little round circle, that is the mouth there. And it opens like a perfect um, circle like a hollow tube and they can suck in the food from quite a long distance away. I mean they eat up to 80 full grown shrimp a day up to two centimeters long and they can suck them in from quite a long way away and, and if you're underwater or if you're next to an aquarium full of seahorse you can actually hear the snapping sound as they suck them in. 
Now, the other remarkable thing about seahorses is they have this amazing prehensile tail. And I, I truly believe that it, it has a mind of its own. Having watched seahorses so often now, they seem to swim along and the tail grabs hold of anything. And it literally does grab hold of anything. And they come to a grinding halt. But it's an incredibly strong tail. It'll hold on in the strongest of tides and currents. And it is really difficult to get a seahorse off an object that it's actually holding on to. I mean, this heavily pregnant male who, which was one of our study animals at Studland Bay, I mean, he's held on to that piece of seagrass. And if we had tried to separate him from that, it would have been a really difficult job. But you can actually see also the little spines all over the seahorse that are actually called Siri, and they help to um, blend him in with the habitat. You see the um, seagrass has got um, filaments on it, and it looks very much like the filaments on the seahorse. There's another picture of the tail here, and you can see it's holding on so tight, it's actually broken that stem of seagrass. Um, this is a spider, and you see how tight it's holding on there. Now, I just touched on just a second ago, the Siri, the spines that grow on the seahorses. All species, every single species of seahorse can grow and absorb these spines, these Siri on their bodies. It depends on the habitat they live in, and it also depends on the age of the seahorse as well. And we're talking mainly about spiny seahorses here tonight, which is more a seagrass seahorse. In, in fact, they really should be called seagrass seahorses. Young spiny seahorses have a lot of Siri on their body, and that is because they're moving through the seagrass an awful lot more, and it helps them hide away. As they get older, they absorb the spines back into the body because they sit still a lot more. They're very sedentary. Once they have a habitat, they don't move a great deal. So they're sort of nice and relaxed in against the seagrass there. Now, these two pictures, the bottom left one was taken by Peter Tinsley of um, Dorset Wildlife Trust. And you can see these, this sediment has actually settled on the Siri there and making them look very floppy. The two seahorses on the left hand side are actually spiny seahorse. The picture on the right hand side is a short snouted seahorse. Now, here in the UK, you very seldom get short snouted seahorses with Siri on them because they don't live in the sort of habitat that um, dictates that they need them. This picture was taken in the Mediterranean, and the habitat that that particular seahorse lived in um, required it to have lots of Siri. It takes months for the Siri to come and go, but they can absorb and grow them. Now one of the remarkable things about seahorses, very much like a chameleon, is they can actually change colour. Now they have two ways of doing this. The first one is a base colour that they think makes them hidden away in amongst wherever they live. Sometimes it's quite remarkable to us, they can be really brightly coloured, but bear in mind in the sea red disappears very very quickly, so to another fish a bright red seahorse would actually look grey or black, so it hides away into, into the um, habitats it's living in. The other way is an emotional change of colour. Um, now this is a free spot seahorse, there's a male in the front of us and a female at the back. Seconds before this picture was taken, he was actually the same colour as her, but he's trying to encourage her, he's trying to mate with her and partner with, with her, so he's turned bright white. And if you see the um, black line, all the way around the body, it helps to accentuate the shape of the seahorse as well. There are actually two seahorses in the picture, and this is normal behaviour for them, and they're jet black. I'll just show you where they are. These are Hippocampus cuda, and this picture was taken by a friend of mine in Cambodia. And these seahorses naturally in Cambodia lay down in amongst the detritus, partly because the habitat is so destroyed in Cambodia, they've adapted ways of actually um, be able to hide away in amongst the rubbish that's left over there. Now, through the work of the Trust, we've discovered that seahorses don't make for life. It was a lovely, fantastic, romantic idea, but sadly, the reality is it's for months, not for years. Um, but it is very um, pair faithful, and they do um, do this partnership. And it's a very strong partnership. Every single day they come together and they actually do a dance around each other and they reinforce the pair bonding. And this, this pair again at Studland Bay um, are a pair bonded um, pair and they were together for about three months and bred quite regularly during that time. 
Now, everybody knows the most remarkable thing about seahorses is the males getting pregnant. And it is a true pregnancy. Um, it's the only animal in the animal kingdom where it is a true male pregnancy. And people might say to you, well, why is he a male and why is he a female? He stands, still has testes and produce sperm. She stands ovaries and produces eggs. But it's a way of sharing the role. And in smaller species, by sharing the role of, of the partners, you can actually produce more babies on less wear and tear on the animals involved. So it's a way of more produ uh, producing more babies at any one time. They have bright orange eggs. Um, the female will deposit them inside the male's brew pouch, um, and then they get embedded into the lining of the pouch, very much like a placenta in a mammal, and they receive nutri nutrients, oxygen, blood, but they also have a very rudimentary yolk sac, which is absorbed before they're born. Occasionally, if the um, young are born prematurely, you will actually see this um, um, yolk sac still attached to them. So the male can be pregnant for up to 28 days and produce as many and sometimes a lot more than 1,500 babies at any one time. And he can be in contractions that can last up to 12 hours. But when the final flush comes, he actually produces the babies in seconds. He pumps the tail up to the abdomen and it fills the pouch with um, seawater. It's, it's like just basically pumping them out of, out of them. They're about six to eight millimetres um, from the top of the head to the end of the tail. And they're unfortunately a very handy bite-sized piece of food, but they float in the plankton layer. But sadly, out of every thousand or two thousand um, fry babies that are born, only one might make it to maturity. Now, they're very precocious when they're born and they're not dependent on the parents at all. And I've literally seen them come out of the male's pouch and start to feed like little mini Pac-Men right from the beginning. So, you know, they, they are adapted very well for the life that they're going to have. Now, super dad or silly dad is, is a big question, really, because you think after everything that he's gone through and having contractions for 12 hours and giving birth to thousands of fry, he would learn. But no. They're usually pregnant again 24, 48 hours later. And it does make you wonder why it never caught on in our sp other species, especially humans. It's a lot of hard work, poor fella. Now, one of the downfalls of seahorses is this bony body. And the reason why the Victorians thought they were insects, and they have an internal and an external skeleton covered by skin. And when they die, they actually die out solidly. Now, this solid shape um, very often is it, they're locked into shape by having pins put through them while they're they're dead and uh, while they're dying and might be. So they're in particular shapes for the Chinese medicine and curio trades. Um, Sadly, it is their downfall, and um, as we'll see in a minute, an awful lot are taken for that sort of trade. Now, the plates are actually held together by ligaments, they're triangular, and the whole body is made of triangular plates. And interestingly, um, scientists are now looking at the tail of the seahorse to wait, make um, segmented armour for soldiers, and also to help with building prosthetic limbs for people that, that require them. So the short um, answer to the question, well, so what is a fish? It is a fish, but it's like no other fish as we've seen. And as we go on a little bit further into the talk, you'll see all the things that are actually threatening them and why we, collectively we, have to do something about it. Now they are endangered, facing possible extinction. We estimate through work with our sister organisation in Ireland that they have 25 to 30 years left before they're functionally extinct. This doesn't mean as a species they'll disappear completely, but it'll make them very difficult to breed and keep sustainable populations. Now there are four main reasons why seahorse are under threat. One is overfishing for the curio trade, the aquarium trade and the traditional medicine trades. The other is pollution. The other is disturbance, which um, in Studman Bay, our main study site, we have several study sites now, um, disturbance is caused by boats and noise and stuff like that. And the other, with relevance to tonight and the talks that everybody's doing, is the loss of habitat, especially seagrass. Now, unfortunately, they live in the very shallow waters of the oceans, and that's where mankind spends most of its time, destroying the seas, usually by dropping anchors, um, polluting from boats, all sorts of things. They build there, they take um, the, the sort of seabed and all the rest of it. So it's very important as we go on that we actually start to do something very positive. 
images, um, just quick images to show you. The one on the left was anchor damage. I mean, literally an anchor lifted up and left that hole there. And the two on the right, the top one was as the as the chain had dropped, this was a permanent mooring that had been put in. Um, it started to scare across the seagrass. The second one was after a period of time and the seagrass has gone. So the chain has actually destroyed the seagrass. Now, really, it should look like this. This is a beautiful picture of a, a natural seagrass edge. Um, it hasn't got any sharp edges to it. The rhizome mat, which it grows out of, is spreading through the seagrass, and it has a chance to survive. And if you equate seagrass to the equivalent of a tropical rainforest, you have the same diversity of species, the carbon sequestration, the um, sort of absorbing of waves and stuff like that. So they're very, very important to our shores. This picture, um, Studham Bay, um, taken in 2008, each of those round circles is damaged caused by anchors and also caused by um, illegal mooring chains. There are 51 illegal mooring chains at, at Studham Bay um, and we are slowly doing something about it as you will see in a minute. Now this picture by the Cornwall Wildlife Trust actually shows the situation much clearer. Each of those round circles is caused by a mooring chain. This should be natural habitat there, but as the tide drops and the chain swings round and round, it creates this perfect circle. Um, perfect in imagery, but not perfect for the habitat, unfortunately. So how do we ensure the future of this amazing little horse of the sea? And there are a lot of things that we can do. And Remedies is all about doing that. So it's the work of the Seahorse Trust and all its various partners. Um, in May 2019, after 12 years of collecting data, lobbying and submitting it for protection, we finally got Studland Bay made into a marine conservation zone. We've also submitted to many other marine conservation zones as well around the country. And we advise other people on, on um, you know, sort of seahorse conservation. The fantastic news is, and why, you know, we're quite excited about this, is we've just received a license and um, plan to install the first 10 eco moorings into Studland Bay over the next six weeks, we hope, um, if everything falls into place, before the summer anyway. What will happen is that we'll be able to um, sort of put these moorings in and actually do something positive for the environment. The only reason why we've managed to be able to do this is because we're being supported by an amazing um, boat services company called Boat Folk. And they are a very, very green marina boat services based company. And they're kindly underwriting the cost of doing all of this for us. And they are making a difference. They're doing a lot of other projects as well, like creating biomes underneath their pontoons. They're an incredible company. And it's, you know, they are perfect people to work with for us and, and thanks to them we can actually do what we're doing. Now just for those that are not sure what uh, eco mooring is, it's basically a two meter helical screw that gets screwed down into the seabed. It has a footprint of roughly four to five inches across. From there to the surface there's a rubber road which is the riser, it's the um, chain or so, so the rubber uh, riser that goes up to the surface and that's attached to a mooring buoy. Now we're having these mooring buoys designed specially to show they're in the seagrass area and they're ecologically friendly. So to be able to preserve the habitat we get this, we get beautiful spiny seahorses, we get pristine seagrass bed, working in partnership together, we have to be able to do. So we have to ask ourselves, do we want this or do we want this? <clears throat> a deprived habitat with nowhere for the seahorses to go. And this picture I actually took last year in 2020, and these seahorses had actually been disturbed um, by anchors and people in the water, and they'd moved off the seagrass I don't know if they ever went back to their habitat, but it was a sad sight to see. We've still got so much look more to learn about these incredible fish and, and only by working in partnership um, can we actually make a difference. And, and the um, strap line of the Seahorse Trust is working in partnership with nature. And together we do make a difference. We're working with boat folk, we're working with Southampton University, Portsmouth Union, lots of other different organisations and people. And we are going to make a difference. Can I just give a plug just before I finish to, if you've enjoyed learning this little bit about seahorses, we had just written an online course about seahorse biology and ecology and conservation. It's a 12 part online course that can be done 
at your own leisure. Um, please contact us at the Seahorse Trust if you, if you want to take part. I want to thank you for listening tonight. It's a short piece. Um, as a lot of people say, I go on too much, unfortunately. Um, at this point, I'd like to pass over to Lizzie, who's going to talk about slugs and snails underwater. Go ahead, Lizzie. Thank you very much, Neil. I'm just going to uh, share my screen. I'll try and turn mine off. If I can. <laughs> um. Perfect. Um, so, uh, as Loveday said, my name is Lizzie and I'm a support biologist at the National Marine Aquarium. So um, I think I like to refer to myself as a marine biologist and environmental educator. So during my time at the uh, NMA, uh, I've been there for four years now, two years in the education department and two years looking after the animals. And ever since um, I started studying marine biology, I've just really loved the small, squishy, tiny creatures um, that lots of people often overlook. Now, when you think of seagrass beds, most of the time you might think of creatures like seahorses, which you've just learned all about, or turtles. But there are some really cool creatures there that I'd like to introduce to you today. And they are the gastropods, so the snails, the sea slugs and the sea hares. And I think they're really cute. And hopefully by the end of this talk, you'll find out um, just how amazing they are and learn to love them as well. So. I named my talk Fascinating Tales of Slugs, Sea Hares and Snails. And we're going to talk a little bit about what these creatures are, how they live their lives, which species you can find in our seagrass beds, if they do anything for the seagrass beds, and uh, what they might do for us humans. So before we get started, all of these creatures we're going to talk about um, today are gastropods. So gastropods are um, a class of mollusks. And gastropod means stomach foot in Greek, um, because if you look at the diagram, you see they have a foot and a stomach, and that was good enough for the Greeks to give them their name. Now, they're a really diverse group of um, creatures. So there's around 35,000 species that we know of living on land, in rivers and in the ocean. And that makes up 70 to 80 percent of all the mollusks. So these guys are really diverse and quite important. Now, they can have a shell like the snails you find in your garden, um, but not always. Um, some might have a small internal shell and others might not have a shell at all. Now, the way they move is using this muscular foot. And if you rub your hands together really quickly, um, you can feel this heat building up, this friction. So if you were a little snail going around uh, on the sea floor, um, you might find it quite unpleasant if uh, you couldn't make something to reduce the friction. So these animals uh, are super slimy, just like slugs and snails we find in our garden. So first of all, we're going to talk about the sea snails. So these guys, um, they have the visible external shell. So this guy here is a periwinkle. Um, you often find them on the seaweeds and sea grasses. Um, and snails eat seaweed and sea grass and algae. Um, but some, as we'll find out in a second, are uh, fearsome predators and carnivorous. Now, um, they're harvested for food, for aquaculture, um, but we also have them uh, a lot in the aquarium industry. So in lots of our tanks at the NMA, we'll have a couple of snails because they're really good uh, at cleaning the algae. They're like a little cleanup crew. So this is the first uh, snail and it is the whelk. So it's the largest of the sea snails. Its shell is around 10 centimetres long. And this is one of those big bad carnivores that I mentioned. They feed on worms uh, and other mollusks, and most sadly, my favourite, the barnacle. Now, you might have seen some evidence of whelks on your walks on the beach if you've come across something that looks a bit like this. Looks a bit like a weird sponge, and that's actually the empty egg cases of the whelk. So they lay about 2,000 eggs in one go, um, stick them underneath some algae, um, and then when they um, hatch out and wash up on the shore, they look like this kind of strange um, spongy mass. Now, whelks are really um, important creatures in their own right, but once they die, they have another really important role as homes for hermit crabs. This next one's uh, my absolute favourite sea snail. 
and it is the humble common limpet and I can never get over how cute this photo is. Um, it's one of my favourites, I think. So they're typically found on the rocky shore, but they also like to explore the shallows where uh, seagrass beds can be found. And they're real homebodies, and they like to go out for a scavenge to find some food, but they always like coming back to the same place. Uh, it's called a home scar. And if you look, you can actually see the, the round indentations in the rock where, where they kind of wiggle themselves down every night. And um, some even go so far as to um, pick up algae and put it around their home scar to make themselves an algae garden so they can have a quick little snack without leaving their home. Now, all the gastropods have a, a really neat tool and it's called a radula. Uh, and it's like their tongue, but their tongues aren't like us. Their tongues look like this. So this is a radula of a limpet and it's basically a tongue covered in teeth. And they use these to scrape the uh, layers of algae and bacteria off the rocks. Um, and scientists have actually found out that it's the strongest biological material, weight for weight. So it used to be uh, spider silk that they thought was the strongest, but researchers uh, suggested it's actually uh, the limpet radula, which could be the next kind of biological um, inspiration for materials to make heavy wearing things like stab vests and aeroplane chassis and cars. So you never know the next time you fly in the future could be on a limpet inspired airplane. Moving on to our next group, which is the sea hares. Um, again, a very quirky looking creature. Um, they're named sea hares because of their two hair like ears. Now, some of these guys have uh, shells, but they're kept inside their bodies uh, on their backs. And they have these long fleshy thrills along their body called parapodia, which means beyond feet in Greek. Uh, and they use these for getting around. So it's kind of like twirling a skirt uh, to swim through the ocean. Now, these guys mostly eat seaweed and seagrass and the colour they are is often dictated by what they like to eat. Um, so this common sea hare here has probably been uh, nibbling some red algae because it's a nice red colour. Um, but if it started eating the seagrass that it's on, it would actually start turning green. Now, when uh, if you were to go up to a sea hare and give it a bit of a fright, um, it would do two things. It would fire some ink at you and also release a kind of sticky white substance that would cl like clog up your um, your feeding and feeling apparatus if you were trying to eat it. Now, uh, the strangest thing I found out about sea hares when I was doing the research for this talk uh, is about how they reproduce. So they're hermaphrodites, so they have male and female reproductive organs. And when a sea hare decides it's time to mate, uh, it sends out lots of pheromones um, to announce uh, its intentions to the rest of the sea hares, um, who promptly come and form a line, uh, which our scientists referred to as a love chain, um, to breed. So basically the one in front is a female, then the next one's a male, and it alternates female and male all along the line, um, and they fertilise their eggs. Um, so yeah, they have a love chain, which is pretty nifty. And uh, when they lay their eggs, they look like spaghetti. Um, so again, you can he see it here stuck on, um, on some seaweed. So if you see something that looks like silly string on your walks on the beach, it is the pro-reduce of a sea hair love chain. Now sea slugs like this adorable sea lemon here are another different type of uh, gastropod you might find in the seagrass beds. Um, their body is made up of two flaps um, which they kind of fold in and most of them eat seaweed and seagrass though some do feed on other animals like sea sponges and ascidians and they suck the juice out of the cells but the next one does something even cooler. Um, so I've got a video here of a very cute and amazing creature called the solar powered sea slug. Now the solar powered sea slug doesn't just suck out the juice of the um, algal cells, it actually takes out the chloroplast. So those are the parts of the cell which contain the green pigment chlorophyll uh, which plants use to photosynthesize. So they take them out of the plant and stick them in their skin. Um, so they, these guys can actually photosynthesize and make their own food from the sun, uh, just like a plant. Um, and it's an example of an endosymbiotic relationship. So that's when one animal lives inside the other. 
So the chloroplast gets the protection of living inside a slug and the, um, the sea slug gets um, to look really awesome and make its own food using sunlight. And my favourite uh, fact about these um, sea slugs is that when they feel threatened, they camouflage themselves by unfolding their two um, flaps of skin and turning into a leaf. Um, so I think these are my favourite discovery um, when researching for this talk and there are some beautiful videos of them uh, for you to go and explore uh, after the talk. So the next ones and um, the final ones we're going to talk about today are the nudibranchs. So nudibranchs are a type of sea slug. So uh, all nudibranchs are sea slugs but not all sea slugs are nudibranchs and if you look on the back of this one here it's got lots of sticky out projections and those are actually its gills. So nudibranch means naked gill um, because they just have their gills on their backs and they like to eat sponges, anemones, bryozoans and ascidians. And these guys in a similar kind of trick to the solar powered sea slug um, actually take something from their prey and use it uh, for their own benefit. But instead of uh, photosynthesizing, these guys take the stinging cells from the anemones and pop them in their skin so that if anything tries to eat them, they'll get a very stingy surprise. And they're just gorgeous creatures. So these are all different ones you can find around our coasts in the seagrass beds and around the rocky shores too. So we have like the violet sea slug, the orange clud sea slug, the grey sea slug, and my favourite, the scarlet lady. So we've talked about all the different types of um, gastropods you can find, or at least a few of them, around our seagrass beds, but what do they actually do for seagrass? Well, they're actually really important in keeping the seagrass healthy um, because they're kind of like gardeners of the seagrass beds. So in the ocean, you have lots of little algae and um, phytoplankton, which can grow really, really quickly and stick onto the seagrass. And because the seagrass is quite slow growing, it can get really quickly overwhelmed and become really poorly. So what these guys do is basically keep all the algae under control. So in the aquarium, we actually have a tank full of um, seagrass, real seagrass that we uh, look after. And every single day we have to clean it by hand because even overnight you'll get quite a thick layer of algae growing on um, the seagrass blades. So in the wild, they wouldn't need marine biologists to hand clean them because they'd have these really amazing gastropods uh, keeping, themselves, keeping the seagrass clean um, just by uh, being there and feeding. So these are really important creatures to have around, uh, especially in areas where seagrass beds are exposed to nutrient pollution, so runoff from farms and things like that. And they're so important uh, in keeping the seagrass healthy that they've actually been considered as key players in seagrass restoration projects. So um, there's an example of uh, Elkhorn Slough in Monterey, USA, uh, where they found that um, historically the sea otters had been uh, hunted um, out of the area and that led to an increase in crabs and crabs love snacking on sea slugs so this meant that there weren't many sea slugs to keep the seagrass healthy and they found that they reintroduced the otters uh, which helped the um, the crab population get back under control but they actually also introduced sea slugs too um, from the bottom to restore and they found that seagrass, even in quite nutrient polluted waters, was doing much, much better with these little guys around. So they might be tiny, but they are very powerful in their role uh, of protecting the seagrass. And finally, they're just wonderful ambassadors for seagrass beds and the ocean in general. I'm a big believer that the more we learn about the ocean and all the different animals that live in it, the more they can teach us um, and inspire us to protect not only the homes where they live, but the ocean in general, which does, uh, does need our help and looking after. Um, so that was my talk on slugs, sea snails, sea hares. Um, so I hope you guys have learned some cool facts. Um, and I'm gonna pass on now to Paul Cox, who is the managing director for the Sharks Trust. Okay, hello everyone, hold on. It might have come up on your screens, but it hasn't come up on mine yet. So, I'll just wait. Um, there we are. Uh, 
screen share. I am screen sharing. Good, right. Um, so um, thanks very much um, for inviting me, Love Day, um, today. And um, welcome, everyone. Um, Love Day asked me to talk about um, the seabed in, in around the UK and the creatures that live within it. So obviously I thought I'd start with a story about a pelagic shark from Australia. So I want to tell you a, a little story about this shark, uh, which, come on, which is the tiger shark. Now this is one of the best known of the 500 or so types of shark that we have, that we share um, the ocean with. Uh, the tiger shark is a large, I think, beautiful. Um, it's about a large and very powerful shark. The females, um, the, the large females have been measured at over five meters. So that's, you know, bigger than a large car um, and weigh up to about 900 kilograms. So kind of the weight of a small car. Um, they have phenomenal teeth, uh, the tiger shark. Um, whilst most sharks or many sharks have teeth that are specially adapted for particular foods. So um, the mako shark, for example, has these very long spiky um, backward facing teeth that are very good, like forks on, uh, you know, the prongs on a fork for catching slippery fish. And the great white shark has these triangular serrated steak knife teeth for cutting chunks out of seals. The tiger shark has this kind of um, Swiss army knife, I guess, um, of teeth, um, which make it very adaptable. It's, the tiger shark is capable of eating just about anything. Um, and they do. And they've been found, the stomach contents found with all sorts of things in their stomachs from squid, uh, seabirds, seals to number plates and tires. They, they, they are the garbage bins of the sea. Um, now, we all know that sharks are big, well, apart from the small ones, but you know, we'll go with that. Um, and we know that they are top predators, apart from the ones that aren't top predators. Uh, my point is sharks are much more diverse than we give them credit for. Um, but it's it's understandable that they might have a habit of, of um, scaring their prey, of creating fear um, within the prey that they encounter. Um, and in the case of the tiger shark, this is actually uh, proved to be quite a good thing. Their fearsome reputation has actually been seen to have a beneficial effect on the environment and the environment in particular being seagrass beds in Australia. Um, so the tiger shark in this story is a kind of an eco warrior, if you like. Um, so the tiger shark plays the part of the goodie in our story and the part of the baddie, I'm afraid, um, is played by two um, characters that we're very familiar with. One is the, the green turtle, our very lovely animal, um, but the green turtle in this story is a baddie, and the other one is the dugong, um, the sea cow, um, stunning, weird-looking creatures. They're, you can see here kind of hoovering up the seabed. They're like, well, kind of like a flymo going across this seagrass bed, and that's the point of, of why they're essentially the baddies in, in this story, because these two creatures have an insatiable appetite for um, seagrass. Um, and they munch through it like it's going out of fashion. And if left to their own devices, they, they basically nibble it down to the roots and leave all the animals, all the benefits we hear about seagrass kind of, kind of exposed and the, the benefits of the seagrass would be um, kind of massively depleted. Um, so there are kind of disturbance to the seagrass, these, these, these heavy grazers. Um, and if you add climate change into that or climate events into that, then um, you've got a recipe for disaster. And this has been kind of tried out in real life um, in Australia. In Shark Bay in 2011, there was an extreme um, heat wave which caused um, big he heating of the water in Shark Bay and caused the near destruction of the seagrass beds. And as the ecosystem has slowly over the years recovered, um, a team of scientists have kind of taken that opportunity to see what factors affect the kind of regrowth of the seagrass and the and the recovery of the seagrass bed upon which a whole community relies. And they made some surprising discoveries about sharks and the role of sharks. And the reason for that is this, the tiger shark, because the tiger shark, uh, whilst being a pelagic shark, they like to hang around the seagrass beds. They like to um, they like to sit and patrol those shallow waters above the seagrass beds where they can find lots of their prey. Um, and essentially they found, these scientists found that where these sharks are patrolling the seagrass and making their presence felt, 
um, they keep these diners on their toes. They, um, they altered the behaviors of these super grazers um, and cut down on their feeding. And that, so areas where um, sharks were present um, recover quicker and, and more fully than areas where sharks are absent. So the sharks are basically kind of protecting the seagrass beds and allowing them uh, to recover. So as with everything in nature, it's, it's all about balance and sharks are part of the balance in this, in this ecosystem. Um, and uh, where things go wrong, so where you've got maybe one stressor of the grazers and another stressor piled on top of that of the, of the climate change, the presence of sharks it becomes really, really important, a real factor in allowing uh, the, the ecosystem to overcome the stress. Um, the good bit about this story, the best bit about this story, is that dugongs or turtles aren't even necessarily harmed in making this story. Um, the, their wariness of the sharks alone is enough to keep them at bay, um, and so the two almost never um, interact. And I guess the key point about this is that these multiple stresses which face um, these seabed habitats um, include grazers and they include the presence or absence of predators. Where large predators are removed, usually through things like overfishing, um, then um, it can have a really big effect upon, um, upon the habitat. And we're only really learning, we only really have this study, and this, this paper was were only came out a year ago, and so we're really only learning about that dynamic between top predators, habitat grazers, and how it all kind of fits together. So it's a nice story, even though it's got nothing to do with uh, UK um, seabed. Um, but of course, there are no tiger sharks in UK waters, um, unless you read the red tops every July. But let's just say there aren't tiger sharks in UK waters. But we do have many stunning and fascinating sharks in our waters. Here's a little infographic of uh, the kind of range of sharks that we can find um, in our waters. And there are large and small, there are fast and slow, they're all there. And so British sharks really include some, some um, fascinating sharks from the super speedy mako shark, the fastest shark in the sea, sleek, um, streamlined, shiny animal, um, which kind of comes into our waters from time to time. Uh, we've got the basking shark, which is kind of a wildlife icon, really. We see these um, appearing now every, every spring and summer and into the autumn. They, they um, make an appearance in the southwest. We've seen quite a few records of them. Um, already this year and starting fairly early this year and then they make their way up the west coast and we, we have site, large aggregations being sighted around the west coast of Scotland and the Hebrides so a real kind of UK wildlife icon. We also have probably slightly less known as a UK shark the fascinating Greenland shark. I've got a whole talk which goes on for an hour on the Greenland shark so I'm not going to go into that but um, only very recently within the last I think six years um, this shark has been um, found to be the longest living vertebrate estimated to live um, up to 400 years. So, you know, if you think about the, the potentially a sh there are sharks in the sea today, which are around in Shakespeare's time when, you know, when the, um, the Mayflower was taking the Pilgrim Fathers um, across the Atlantic um, to, to establish the states. Um, I mean, it's, qu it's quite extraordinary. So the Greenland shark, another British shark, and of course the beautiful, just beautiful blue sharks, which have to do this massive migration around around the Atlantic and and pop in to see us as it were um, in in summer um, and particularly down in the southwest we get quite large numbers of these um, along the coast and quite easily viewable from you know from a um, if you go out on a rib a few miles um, so all of these kind of um, you know, classic sharks, tubular, silvery, grey things with fins on the back and a tail, um, which don't really have a lot to do with um, with the seabed, don't really interact with the seabed as far as we know. But as I, as I mentioned with the tiger sharks, we've still got a lot um, to learn. But there are other sharks that live um, on the seabed around the UK. And one of them is the, is the ever popular lesser spotted cat shark. Um, this is a, a young, yeah, let's just spot a jag cat shark, probably in an aquarium. Um, but uh, these tend to live, they're better known for living on kind of, they live on a pretty mixed sediment. They live on the seabed or around rocks or in um, in kelp, be uh, kelp beds or rack forests. Um, but they also have been spotted um, in 
seagrass beds and it makes sense that might find, sh find shelter and food within um, seagrass beds. Um, we've also got the uh, the flat sharks, the, this stunning angel shark, which is, a, which is a flattened shark. You see its body shape is completely different to the sharks that we're kind of used to seeing in the, in the newspapers. Um, and the coloration suggests that it's a, this is a seabed dweller. They live on sandy seabeds. They, you know, a lot of the time they will interact with seagrass beds. Um, they're critically endangered, um, particularly around, uh, you know, in, in, around the, the, the Northeast Atlantic and into the Mediterranean. There are three species of angel shark. There's one that um, is native to the UK, thought to be um, locally extinct, but um, over the last few years, there have been um, sightings around um, Wales, um, around, around the Welsh coast, and there is now a project um, which has been set up, the Angel Shark Project Wales, which is um, a kind of mixture of a citizen science engagement, fisheries engagement project to look at that population, understand more about it, see how it's interacting with habitats. They've drawn up an action plan, which includes looking at valuable habitats and, and seagrass being, being one of them. So the Angel Shark is really a kind of an interesting story and it's kind of watched this space because where we thought they, they weren't around the UK anymore, it turns out they, they potentially are. Uh, but we don't know how kind of um, resident um, they are. Um, and we haven't got the flattest of flat sharks, if you like, the skates and rays. So strictly speaking, not sharks, but we consider them part of the shark family and certainly the shark trust, we consider them part of our, our remit. Um, and, and this is really where the relationship again, kind of between um, sharks and in this case, skates and rays and seagrass comes home to roost. Those Seagrass beds again provide one of the habitats that would provide a nursery ground uh, for the for the young and the small um, um, skates and rays, um, as it does for many many other um, for many other species where it's kind of that nursery ground where it pro provides that protection and provides the food while animals um, grow into their adult form. So freshly hatched, the, um, these are from an aquarium, but it gives you an idea of what the um, what young um, skates and rays look like. Um, freshly hatched, they will seek that shelter and seagrass provides it in abundance. So they're quite usually associated um, with, with seagrass beds um, as well as other, other protective environments. Um, and so there are, in total, there are 18 species of of um, skates and rays, um, which are recorded in UK waters. About eight of them are kind of more common. Um, and in that, in, as, a, as adults, they spend much of their time hiding on, or in this case, kind of in, um, in the seabed um, where they will kind of hide out and wait for their prey and, 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 and grab things out of the, out of the seabed themselves. They are, some of them are commercially valuable. Um, and so, and as sharing all of the um, uh, life, life, life history characteristics of sharks, they're slow to breed, they are, they're sparing in their reproduction, they're not great in terms of um, the amount that they reproduce, and therefore they're, they're, they're not very great at supporting fisheries, and so sustainability is really key to ensuring that we keep these, these animals on our seabed um, and working with fisheries to make sure that, that they don't overfish. Um, these species. Um, they're all really beautiful animals and actually from my time I, when I used to work at the, uh, at the National Marine Aquarium, I know that you know sharks are the kind of the, the, the big draw but I think rays as well get a fantastic amount of attention and I think they really don't enjoy um, enough of the limelight because we have some beautiful you know huge um, skates um, in our waters. But while the uh, young skates um, in particular are um, settling in and maybe using this the seagrass beds as, as, um, as a nursery ground, something else happens to their former home, um, their, their former home being um, egg cases. So they, these mermaids purses, which is where the mermaid came from in the title, these mermaids purses wash up on the shore on pretty much every beach around the UK um, and they um, they can be found by anyone. These are skate eggs from, uh, from the Orkneys, um, but there are smaller skate eggs which can be found pretty much all around um, the coast. And um, anyone can look for them and anyone can find them. And that is the kind of um, thinking behind our great egg case hunt, which is one of the projects that we run with a little bit of a search in the strand line, 
you can find them. I mean, it, it is dead easy. And then using the resources from our egg, egg case, um, Great Egg Case Hunt project, you can identify what species you've, you've found, you can find out more about those species, and you can record them. And while it might seem like, well, if I record a couple of these egg cases, what does it matter? If more people join in, citizen science is all about the volume of people getting involved. Um, with hundreds of thousands of records, we've now got approaching 300,000 records from thousands of people all around the UK and other countries joining in now. We can build up a really good picture of, of where those nursery are, areas are, where those breeding grounds are, where they're laying their eggs. Um, and that information kind of brought together from each of us um, really enables us to, to enact protection um, of that, that, those vital habitats that support valuable and beautiful species. So really just like the tiger shark, um, but we do it without teeth. Um, so if you want to do something for um, sharks, skates and rays, and potentially um, help to support the protection of vital habitats, straightforward way of doing it, get out there on the beach and look for egg cases. So um, that's all I've got to say to you this evening. Thank you very much for your time and thank you very much for listening. I look forward to seeing some questions um, and I look forward to seeing lots of egg cases uh, records rolling into our database. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, Paul. And thank you, everyone. Thanks uh, to all of our lovely panellists uh, for sharing such uh, amazing presentations. Um, fascinating all round, I think, really. I mean, we just, uh, we have such incredible life in our shores. Uh, so lucky to have it and uh, to hear from the experts on, on what we've got and uh, how it's so reliant on, on the seabed habitats that we have. Uh, it's really, uh, really good stuff. Thank you, everybody. Um, you guys have been very quiet on the question front. Uh, we normally have, have lots and lots of questions, which means that this time our panelists covered everything that you guys wanted to know at home. They were so good in their presentations. Uh, they just nailed all of that information. There's nothing left to share, but luckily, <laughs> Uh, we did have uh, some questions sent in before the webinar, so uh, a few people in the registration form there did type in some questions uh, ahead of time. So we do have a couple of questions uh, that have come in and a couple that came in on the chat. So uh, I'll read out the questions uh, and see who wants to answer. It should be fairly obvious because it's either going to be about seahorses, fucking snails or sharks. So here we go. Uh, a seahorse one first. Um, when someone wrote in, uh, how badly are our seahorses affected by habitat loss and how long would it take to, to recover their populations if we were to protect the habitat? Yeah, I mean, seahorses are facing a very dire future at the moment, um, <clears throat> partly through um, habitat loss, but as, as I was explaining earlier on, also through the free trades, the Chinese curio and aquarium trades. Um, they can recover amazingly quickly. I mean, we had a classic example last year. After the first lockdown at Studland Bay, um, we went there and we actually identified 46 individual seahorses. Now, that was pretty remarkable. We, we, that was the highest number we'd ever identified on the site. But what was even more remarkable, on the first dive, we came across 16 seahorses. Second dive, we came across 17. The third dive was two, but that was because we had only had the meters visibility. And the fourth dive, we came across 21 seahorses. Now, we've never had those sort of numbers in one place at one time. The most we'd ever had prior to that was nine. So it just shows if you take away the problems that are causing the damage, the noise and all the rest of it, seahorses will recover very quickly. But the flip side to that, unfortunately, as everybody was staycationing and we had more boats than we've ever had at um, Studland Bay last year, some days up to 450 boats in an area the size of the six football beaches, the seahorses vanished very, very quickly. And whereas normally they'll disappear by the end of September, October, as they migrate into deeper water, they were gone sort of in large numbers. They were gone beginning of September and we noticed the numbers drop very, very rapidly. So we can recover it. We are, as, as I explained in the talk, we're actually putting all these moorings in very, very soon, thanks to boat folk. And we hopefully there'll be other projects going on down there as well. There's a talk about a reseeding project and things like that. So we've a great deal of working together uh, with a lot of will 
uh, we can actually make certain sites recover very, very quickly. And, you know, if, if the habitat's right and the ecology is right, the species will return very, very quickly. But we've got to have enough of the species left to be able to return. And that's why time isn't quite on our side. We've got to act now. We can't act in 10, 20, 30 years time. We haven't got that sort of time. So fantastic. We're starting to put in these eco moorings this year and that will instantly start to make a difference. Wonderful. That's great, Neil. Well, a nice ocean optimistic uh, viewpoint there. We can make a difference as long as we, we do it in ocean optimism. Uh, absolutely fantastic. Um, we did have someone, one, someone right, uh, Lizzie, while you were doing your talk, um, you were talking about the, the, the little uh, sea hares, I think, munching on the seagrass. Uh, and someone wanted to know how much they actually eat. Uh, do, they, do they make a, an impact? <laughs> Is it teeny tiny amounts? <laughs> That is a very good question. Um, I imagine it would be um, a case of how many sea hares and slugs there were. Um, I guess it would be like if you had a, a garden and you had some snails in there, how much do you notice they're nibbling on your plants? Some years you might have, like my uh, courgette plants in my allotment were decimated by I think one very hungry slug overnight. Um, so it depends on the appetite of the slug, um, I think, and the number of them that are there. Um, yeah, I think that would be my uh, answer. Yeah, that's a good answer. I like that one. Depends on the slug. Uh, personally, I could eat quite a lot of donuts, but that's probably not true of everyone. Um, nice. Yeah, I imagine a tiny sea slug is probably not going to have a, a huge impact on a sea grass bed. Um, but yeah, no, good answer. Um, sorry, someone jumping in there. Okay. Um, so we do have a shark question, um, and it's quite an interesting one actually. We've got a shark one here that's uh, about sort of encouraging shark populations and sort of improving shark populations and how you go about doing that without worrying people. <laughs> you did mention the, the headlines of uh, Great Whites in, in the southwest, uh, Paul, but uh, how do you encourage uh, increasing shark populations without people getting worried about that? Um, okay, so well, I think um, two things. I mean, I think it's not it's not so much about in, encouraging more po shark populations, but about just kind of stop depleting the ones that, that there are. Um, in terms of the perception thing, I think we, I think that the strategy for this is just to drown out all that negativity about sharks with positive stories. There are so many people these days, I'm going to kind of, you know, channel Neil on this. Um, it's about being more positive about things. I think there's so many people that do, that are lucky enough to spend time underwater with sharks or to experience sharks in aquariums. And people who have done that, um, who have had that experience, just look at them differently and I think we it's down to all of us who've, who've, who've been lucky enough to have those experiences to share them and just talk positively don't try and kind of don't try and argue the point just talk about how great they are and how wonderful they are and, and what and what an important part of of um, the ecosystem they are like that story about the, the tiger sharks and the seagrasses I mean it's just a kind of very subtle why they matter um, but we need to get those positive stories out there and, and just don't don't listen to the stuff that's in the it's not worth getting upset about. Good message, yeah, absolutely. Don't worry about it. No, they're great creatures, they're amazing. Um, we have actually just had a really good question written into, uh, into the Q&A here. Uh, are rising sea temperatures and changes in levels of salinity uh, and those sorts of parameters um, affecting any UK species? Uh, so any of our species, so any panelists, feel free to jump in here, seahorses, sharks, gastropods, um, are those parameters affecting things? Okay, can, I, can I just answer that one with regard to seahorses? Um, we, we, we've always had seahorses in British waters and there's this myth going around at the moment that seahorses are here because of global warming and rising sea temperatures. But a little bit of work I did with a volunteer a few years ago, um, we, we were discovering through um, archaeology that seahorses have been recorded by the um, Pictish tribes since the third and fifth century here in the UK. We have um, other archaeology um, that proves to us that they've always been here. Now, you know, the British Isles have, has had 
sort of warming and cooling seas for a very long time. With regard to the seahorses, it's not affecting them as it would be, and I'm sure Paul and Lizzie will explain this further, um, species like that. So seahorses are very adaptive. Um, we find them here in the UK from six degrees right up to, I mean, the highest temperature recorded at Studland was 22. So, you know, they, they are an adaptable species, but I'm sure Paul and Lizzie will explain more about their respective species and how it affects them. So um, in terms of the gastropods, something that um, really affects them is actually changing levels of pH. Um, so with the, um, the rising temperatures, um, some areas of the ocean are becoming more acidic. And if you uh, think about them making their shells, um, they're finding that in some areas that their shells are becoming thinner. They're not able to make very robust shells. Um, and for a, a snail where that's its... Um, its main form of defence, that's obviously going to be a real um, a real problem um, for them. So I think change in pH is probably one of the, the biggest um, stresses associated with climate change. Um, apart from obviously uh, the change in temperature shifting where species are. So if you're a, a species that's really dependent on seagrass and the temperatures are causing all the, the distributions of different species to change, it could also um, kind of mess up the ecosystem that way too. Sorry, that, you're on mute. Shall I answer for sharks? <laughs> yeah, go for it. <laughs> um, yeah, okay, so there's, there's sort of a long answer and a short answer. It's essentially with sharks, with a lot of sharks, they're quite mobile. So when you get changes in sea temperature, then um, that would probably create kind of food chain effects where you see plankton, for example, would, would shift its range and then the predator species might move and so but sharks are able to kind of move their ranges um or the majority of sharks there are small sharks of course that can't do that um and so you might start to see changes in range now there's been lots of speculation about this in in um various kind of places and but at the moment there's there's not really any evidence that we're seeing kind of an influx of different um different species in uh, around the uk you might look at basking sharks as an interesting case because they feed directly on plankton um, and so plankton respond very quickly uh, to climate shifts and um, basking sharks are very intelligent feeders so they are able to kind of pick up on and they will follow where the kind of high concentrations of the best plankton is so it's po potentially you might see some shifts in basking shark range um, as as kind of those 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 ecosystem effects um, happen. There's also been just kind of um, moving on to what Lizzie was talking about with um, acidification. There's been a few kind of early studies that indicate that um, sharks. I don't know if anyone can remember seeing the the little picture, the great picture of the little um, cat shark, which showed really clearly those teeth that they have all over their skin. Um, so sharks have these dermal denticles where it's essentially teeth all over the skin and there's a little bit of evidence that um, elevated pH um, can actually um, affect those denticles and can cause them to not form as well. So there's potentially some impact there on, on um, sharks, but it's very early days to kind of um, say anything conclusive. So it's kind of really one to watch. There's lots of um, interest starting to happen. Um, and I think one of, I think the other part of the um, question was what can be done? Um, I mean, what can be done about, I think, you know, it's really important actually, I, I, whenever I talk about sharks and threats, threats to sharks, we always talk about overfishing. And that's, that's a really important, that, you know, the, the key thing that's causing harm to shark populations as of today is the fact that they're being fished beyond their ability to, to re repopulate themselves. Um, and as with the story about the, the, the multiple stresses with the seagrass and the climate change and the, and the grazers and the removal of predators, it's about it, the more pressure you put on a system, then the less likely it can cope. So if we want shark populations to be able to adapt or any populations to be able to adapt to climate change, then 
are overfishing them to the point where their populations are stressed is not a great idea. So, um, so I think there's kind of it's about thinking about all the different stresses that are placed upon wildlife and the environment, and and looking at them as, as the whole because it's very difficult to kind of turn around the climate change thing overnight, even though we can all do our thing. That's the long. That was the medium answer actually. <laughs> that was great. Great answers from from all our panelists there. Thank you. I hope that uh, answers uh, your question, uh, Christopher. Uh, Sarah's just popped in. Um, we'll, we'll have this as the last one because I'm, I'm very aware we've gone uh, over time. Thank you for sticking with us, everybody. Um, we do have uh, Paul and uh, are there any opportunities to volunteer with sharks in the southwest at the moment? Sorry, Paul, you, you're muted. Sorry, you're doing what I did just now. <laughs> <laughs> it's told me. Um, <laughs> Uh, not as of today, we haven't got any volunteer opportunities with the Shark Trust. It's always worth looking around, looking around at um, kind of the websites of the various different organisations, the Shark Trust and the Wildlife Trust, and so on. Um, but also, you know, volunteer volunteering is also going out and collecting egg cases and recording them because that's a really useful thing that people can do, um, and you know, just do it. So, um, get involved in in the citizen science projects is is a really really useful way of of contributing and just engaging more with the with the work of the trust sign up for the mailing list and stuff like that and then you know we'll kind of you'll get more involved with sharks that way brilliant and uh, as you said earlier uh, paul just share your knowledge as well just tell people how great uh, sharks are as well as uh, the seahorses and our uh, slugs and snails share what you know shout about it and tell everyone you know how amazing all the creatures of our, our wonderful oceans are um, we will begin to draw it to a close there. As you can see on the screen, we've had it up for a while now, so hopefully you've all had a chance to either jot it down or take a quick photo. We've got lots of contact information on there at the moment. Um, ways of following the project, ways of following um, the various uh, organisations represented by panellists this evening. Uh, we also do have a new pro uh, project uh, website coming soon, so it's not live at the moment, but it will be in a couple of months' time. Uh, so that's saveourseabed.co.uk, uh, and that's where we'll begin putting up uh, all of the project information, uh, all of our actions, what we're doing, and ways of getting involved. So uh, if you are looking for volunteer opportunities, they'll, they'll be uh, popped on that website as well. Uh, Thank you so much for coming along. Uh, thank you to all of our panellists for doing such wonderful presentations. Uh, very much appreciate everyone's time this evening. Uh, and look out for the next uh, Secrets of the Seabed webinar coming soon. Uh, we will be uh, just sending out a very short uh, survey after this. So if you wouldn't mind filling in that, it really does help us out. If you can't quite bother because it's 20 past seven in the evening and you just want the tea, uh, then it will be sent out in an email at a later date as well. So don't worry, you don't have to catch it now. But when it does come through, uh, do take a few moments to fill that in. It really helps us out. And uh, enjoy the rest of your evenings. Thank you so much for coming along. And uh, have a great rest of your day. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Yeah.